Hi, I'm Alex Kocheter, and I'm going to speak to you about lag screw and the principles of plating. So we've got a few objectives for this. There's really in three parts. We'd like to understand the lag screw principle, to understand the concept of countersinking, and also different modes of plate use, including locking plates. So in the end, what is a screw? It's a device that converts rotatory motion into linear motion. So these are all types of screw. You might think of them as propellers or uh, rotors, but essentially these are air screws for the helicopter and the aeroplane and a water screw for the boat. Similarly, these are screws. Turns out screws have got anatomy and we do need to know a little bit about those to understand how they work really. So they have a head, which you apply the driver to. They have a shank, which is the bit that carries the thread, which is essentially a curled up wedge. And there's a pitch and the pitch is really the distance between the threads in a single threaded screw. And it's the amount that a screw will move in the axis of the shank with one full 360 degree rotation of the screw. So they do actually look like this. And you'll notice that orthopedic screws have got what's called a buttress thread. So it's not a symmetrical uh, equilateral triangle sort of thread like an engineering screw, um, but it's flatter on the side towards the head, which increases pull out strength. So the important thing to know is about the core diameter and the outer diameter of screws. You select your drill on a core diameter screw. So for example, a 1.5 millimeter screw may have a core diameter of 1.1 millimeters, and therefore you'll need a 1.1 millimeter drill for a 1.5 millimeter screw. Otherwise, you drill out all the material available for the screwed thread to grip, grip into. So into fragmentary compression, this is the first and most powerful principle really in fixation of fractures. And what we're talking about here is two bone fragments, a blue one and a pink one for argument's sake. We want to hold them together. We want to compress them together so that they heal by primary intention because bone generally heals in compression. We need to have a path of the screw which will be perpendicular to the fracture plane. We're going to drill two holes. The first hole is going to be the size of the outer diameter of the screw, so the wider screw. So let's say if it's a 1.5 millimeter screw, we'll drill a 1.5 millimeter hole. This is called a gliding hole, and the screw does not gain purchase here. We then, and completely concentrically with that, and there are devices to help you do that, we drill the far cortex with a purchase hole, and this will be the inner diameter of the screw, the core diameter of the screw. And then we go to insert the screw. So we screw it in. It glides in the pink um, proximal fragment or near cortex, and then it starts to bite into the narrower hole, the core diameter hole in the distal or the far cortex. And then you get to a point by which the head seats on the near cortex. And then as you continue to tighten the screw, this starts to compress the fracture between the head of the screw and the threads in the, near, in the far cortex, which compresses the fracture. The screw angle is really important. On the left here, we've got a screw that's been drilled perpendicular to the bone axis, but not perpendicular to the fracture plane. So see what happens. What happens is you get translation of the fracture fragments. Conversely, if you drill it perpendicular to the plane of the fracture, you get good compression 
of the fracture with minimal translation of the fragments against each other. So, jelly babies, what have they got to do with fractures, you ask yourself? Well, they're, they're quite handy for demonstrating some principles, it turns out. So we're going to do a couple of experiments here. And uh, this is a cross section on the left here of what we're going to do. We're going to drill a hole in the top piece here. We're going to drill a hole in the bottom piece. And we're going to put jelly babies in between the two and see, see what happens to them. So drilling a, drilling a core diameter hole through both fragments, what's going to happen to the jelly babies? Are they going to get crushed, as we were just discussing, or are they not? So I'm tightening this now as tight as I possibly can. The, the, the screw is actually squeaking in the wood. It's so tight. But the jelly babies are not really getting crushed, because what's happening is the screw is biting with its thread in both the upper and lower pieces and is not creating any compression. So now we're going to over drill the near cortex. So this is now a gliding hole, which is now the outer diameter of the screw. And we're now going to tighten this up. So this is what we would have in an interfragmentary compression situation. You can see now those poor jelly babies are having a bad day. They're getting really compressed between the two pieces of bone because now we're getting compression between the underside of the head and the far cortex. So just to demonstrate uh, an effective use of lag screws. So lag screws are a very powerful technique. They're very low profile. We can get good rotational stability and compression of uh, a simple fracture construct with this type of technique. And you'll see that these screws are not parallel to each other, but they are both perpendicular to the fracture where they're inserted. So what about countersinking? So on the left here, we are not countersinking the near cortex, and we're driving this screw in as hard as we possibly can. What happens is, as you can start to see, is the near cortex is fracturing because there's a great deal of, of, of pressure and a huge amount of strain occurring underneath the screw head. On the right now, I've countersunk the cortex. And now I'm going to put another screw and I'm going to do it up at least as tight as the one on the left. Let's see what happens. So it's been tightened now. Screws going in. It's biting now onto the near cortex. And I'm doing this as tight as I possibly can. And this is far tighter than you do a bone screw. Really, really tight. And there's minimal fracturing around the head of the screw because it's got much larger surface area to distribute its uh, pressure into and there's a significant strain reduction in engineering terms. So countersinking is not to make the screw nice and smooth, it's not to make it look pretty, it's to stop you fracturing the near cortex when you tighten the screw, which is a massive problem in very fine bones like in the hand. So summary for part one. Any screw is a lag screw because a lag screw is not something you get off the shelf. A lag screw is a technique. You may get partially threaded screws, which have got a thread at the tip and a bare shank at the top, but that's not a lag screw. That's a partially threaded screw. A lag screw is a technique. The screw must be perpendicular to the fracture plane to stop translation and shearing of the, um, the two fragments against each other. The drill holes must be absolutely collinear with each other. Otherwise, again, you, you risk um, an oblique screw and possibly fracturing of the fragments, which is uh, a nightmare in the hand because the bones are so small and you really only get one shot.
a larger outer diameter gliding hole facilitates compression of a fragment between the underside of the head and the thread of the screw, which bites in the far cortex. And countersinking is a really important technique to reduce the risk of fracturing of the near cortex under the head by reducing the amount of strain underneath the head. Okay, so let's move on to plates. The plates is quite a big topic. There's lots of different things to talk about here. First off, I'm going to talk about some of the common modes that we use plates in, and there are more, but we'll stick to these five, and I'm going to spend the third session of this talk talking specifically about locking plates and the differences between locking and non-locking, because I think that causes some confusion. So in the first instance, let's talk about neutralization. So again, neutralization, a bit like lag, is a technique. It's not a, a piece of hardware. And basically what happens, it's to offset forces acting on the fracture construct that are out of plane, for example, out of plane of the, of the lag screw that you just used to fix your fracture. It increases the rigidity and particularly the stability of your construct, which allows you to get function more rapidly. And it may protect a primary stabilization technique. For example, if you've fixed the fracture in compression with a lag screw, that may not be quite strong enough to start function and adding a neutralization plate may allow early rehabilitation, early function, which is many times what we want in the hand. There are many techniques you might use for neutralization. For example, you could use a plaster cast, although that obviously stops function, but it can neutralize a fixation. You can use a plate. You could use an external fixator added to some other form of fixation like K wires or an interfragmentary screw. Or we can use an internal X fix. And I'll show you a, um, a, a um, example of that later on. So what are these rotational and out of plane forces? So here's a model of an interfragmentary um, com compression screw. So let's see what happens when we exert some forces on this. So here I am simulating in plane flexion extension on it and compression on it. But the screw acts as an axle when it comes to out of plane rotational forces. And you can see the fracture might displace and that movement around that axle of the screw will eventually cause it to come loose, lose compression and lead to a non-union. Okay, so this is the same lag screw here, but this time it's gone through a plate. And the plate is held with only two screws on either side. Just for this demonstration, normally would use more, maybe uh, in the fingers, uh, in the phalanges, at least four cortices on either side, if you can. So let's see what happens this time when we stress this construct. So I'm trying really hard to rotate around the lag screw and it's just not moving. It's not moving in other planes nor in compression. So this has significantly increased the robustness of the fixation and this patient can now get on with earlier rehabilitation. So here's an example of a lag screw neutralization plate construct in a proximal phalanx. There's only one screw distally, but that's all you can get in, in this small bone. But that will be enough to allow early rehabilitation. So the next concept to talk about is dynamic compression. So dynamic compression is used where you have a transverse fracture, usually in a simple fracture, like this humerus on the uh, right-hand side of the screen. So a transverse fracture. You can't put a lag screw here because you can't get perpendicular to the fracture plate. So what are we going to do? We're going to use this plating technique. And this is about the shape of the holes in the plate and the shape of the undersurface of the screw head. 
So this is a hardware dependent technique. You need a particular sort of dynamic compression plate. And this is one of the Synthes um, combi hole plates. So on this side uh, of the plate hole is a beveled surface. And on this side is a screwed thread. Is the beveled surface we're interested in. And what you'll see under the screw head is that the screw head is also convex. What happens is you screw the screw in, the convex undersurface of the screw and the beveled surface of the plate hole slide on each other. And that sliding creates translation in the plane perpendicular to the screw. And that's what gives us the compression. So this is a diagram of it. So we've got a blue fragment and a red fragment. Transverse fracture, we want them to be compressed. So we put a dynamic compression plate on one surface of the bone and fix it in with a screw. But instead of drilling another central hole here, we drill one that's on the far side of the fragment to the fracture, so it's away from the fracture in the oval dynamic compression hole. We put a screw in here. And what happens is, as the undersurface of the convexity of the screw head contacts the beveled surface of the hole, and they start to slide on each other. And the fragments are drawn together by converting the rotational longitudinal movement of the screw into the perpendicular movement of compression of the transverse fracture. So does this really happen? Well, look, here's another model. So this is a real uh, 3.5 millimeter DCP plate and a stunt M&M who's volunteered for the purpose. So as I tighten the screw down, you can see that the compressive forces are enough to break the candy there. The compressive forces generated by a DCP are apparently about one quarter those of a interfragmentary compression screw, but this is the only real effective way to compress a transverse fracture. So the next plating technique is anti-glide. So this is a specific technique that um, reduces shear forces where the construct is under compression. Okay. So here's an oblique fracture again. And these two bits of bone are being pushed together by the external tendon and environmental forces upon it. The fracture plane translates some of that compression into shearing, okay? So the two fragments will tend to shear against each other and displace. Clearly a bad thing, because we want it to sit in a reduced position like this. So we could put a plate on it to hold it like that. And this plate is, as you can see, at 90 degrees to the fracture plane. So what happens when we compress on this now? So the, the forces are compressing the fracture together. It's gonna to want to shear. But this construct will tend to fail because it allows movement of the fracture construct perpendicular to the plate. So you can see here, we've got failure of the screw here, movement of the plate, and we'd like to get a non-union or at least a malunion here. Okay. If we put the plate, however, 90 degrees to the last one, in such a way that it creates a little axilla between the plate and one of the fragments that the other fragment just snugs into. So this isn't a compression plate, this is just um, essentially a bridging plate because both of these screws are in neutral positions. And this uh, technique you probably use um, where there's a relatively small, perhaps an articular 
fragment that you just want to support. So we've got the compression forces again. It wants to glide and shear in the plane of the fracture. But what happens now is that the fracture fragment is actually being held in this little axilla between the plate and the other fragment. And that generates compressive forces from the plate and against the other bone. And this is more likely to not only stop the construct falling apart, but also promotes healing by compression in that area. So I mentioned bridge plating a second ago. So this is a, this is a construct where um, you're just holding two main fragments in their anatomical position because no other techniques can be used due to comminution uh, of the central segment. So we want to hold the bone in position. So the two joint surfaces usually are in their anatomical position, but the bit in the middle we can't fix. And so we're going to rely on the biology of the periosteum and fracture healing to heal the multiple fragments in the center together, but we're going to maintain the anatomical position of the bone. So often this uses locking plate technology, but it can be done with um, non-locking plates. And here, for example, is a composite construct utilizing this ladder plate in a bridging mode across this area of common union in this highly multifragmentary proximal phalangeal fracture. Similarly, in this uh, severe distal radial and ulnar fracture here, this is unreconstructable with uh, a plating technique directly to the distal radius. So a bridging plate has been used here, in this case, across the joint rather than just across two parts of the bone. And this is the internal external fixator technique really, uh, utilizing in this case a locking plate to hold the anatomical alignment and relationship of the limb segments and this as you can see here has gone on to unite where the multifragmentary element is you can then take that plate out and get some degree of rehabilitation of the wrist subsequently so locking plates so locking plates again these are this is hardware this is not a technique although there are a lot of techniques involved in using them correctly nevertheless what happens here is that the head of the screw, instead of being smooth or convex, like the non-locking screws that we often use, has a screwed thread around it. And that engages with a mating screw thread in the hole of the plate. What happens is you basically screw the head of the screw into the plate, cause them to act as one implant. We can use screws certainly for that, but it also allows us to use um, things like pegs, for example, which you may have come across in the distal radius, which have less um, biological issues when they come up against um, tendons, for example, or if by chance one ends up in the joint. But it also allows you to place those locked pegs, for example, in a divergent pattern. And the divergence of the implants alone can hold fragments actually very robustly. So I showed you these combi holes in the synthesis plates earlier. Look at them again. So this is the dynamic compression area of the hole. But there's also this area here that's got screwed threads in. And these are the threads that will take a locking screw. So normal non-locking um, screw, as I discussed with interfragmentary screws, is held by friction. And that friction is between the thread and the bone, the head of the screw uh, and the plate or, or the bone, if it's an interfragmentary screw, and in between the plate and the bone. So one of the things that happens with, with a um, non-locking construct, as you tighten the screw, the bone is drawn up against the plate. And this is a demonstration of a dynamic compression construct, but you can see that the 
plate has been drawn down against the bone by the um, compressive pressure under the head and the friction uh, between the screw and the uh, bone and the plate. So this is a little demonstration just of the different types of screws in one plate. So this is a, um, a wrist fracture implant. So this is a non-locking screw and I accept this in fresh air, but it demonstrates that these screws can toggle uh, and change direction, which sometimes is very useful and sometimes less so. This is a locking screw. So as you can see, this screws into the plate and creates a fixed angle between the screw and the plate. So there's a very robust fix between the plate and the screw, which is not the case with the non-locking cortical screw. And this is one of the pegs I talked about. So this is a smooth peg which is in a divergent position against its fellows distally. And again, this has got a very robust fixation and will offset compressive forces acting perpendicular to the plate from the joint, because this is used for periarticular distal fixations. Okay. So final demonstration really of a plate of the non-locking sort being fixed onto a bone. So this just demonstrates very obviously, I think the compression that you get of the plate against the bone. And that poor jelly baby is getting squashed to pieces. Conversely, if we do the same thing with the locking plate, and I have to say uh, I'm using a, a power driver here and I don't recommend that for um, the in vivo situation. Uh, but this is the screws locking into the plate. And you can see the plate is not compressed down against the bone. And that jelly baby there survived to live another day. But what this shows is that the construct is rigid, even though it's not pushed onto the, onto the bone itself. And on one hand, that leads to a slightly bulkier construct. So if you've got tendons uh, around there, that may cause gliding problems. But it does preserve the periosteum of the bone to a greater extent, and it reduces the damage to periosteal blood supply. It also uh, leads to a very powerful bridging technique. But the two different sorts of plate fail in a different way. So the non-locking plate is, as we've said, pushed down onto the bone by the compressive forces of the screw head and thread. But let's say we then start to rehab the patient aggressively, post-operatively. And there's a shearing occurring between the fracture fragments as one would expect from function. So what may happen here is that if there's inadequate hold of the screw into the bone, for example, an osteoporotic fracture or a poorly drilled hole, the threads can give way in the bone and pull out. So as soon as it pulls out and there's loss of that compressive force of the screw against the bone, there's total loss of, of construct stability. And as there's cyclical shearing of the fracture, that pullout just gets worse and worse and the construct fails, leading to a malunion or a non-union. Conversely, if we use a locking plate, we can screw in the screws to the plate and then if we're still in that same high shear environment it's actually very hard for the plate to come off because what has to happen is the screws have to tear through the bone but it's not just one screw that's had to do that 
all the screws in the plate screw construct are having to do that. So it's a much more robust fixation, particularly in osteoporotic bone, for example. So there are pros and cons. You might think that, well, if locking plates are so great, it's just, let's just use them all the time. But you can't lag with the locking construct. They both work neutralization, obviously. Anti-glide doesn't really work with a locking plate construct. You better to have a plate that's compressed onto the bone for that. They're both working bridging, but it's possible that the locking plate construct's better for that. And the locking plate construct does get better fix in poor quality bone because the entire construct has to pull out rather than individual screws one by one, putting more and more stress onto the remaining ones. Locking plate constructs, however, often a little bit bulkier, particularly in the flanges, because you have to have a thickness of plate in which to get um, good hold. So that can be a problem for tendons sometimes, particularly in the fingers. If you've got uh, a, a bone that's at risk of non-union, um, then an effect on peritoneal blood supply is important, and the locking plate minimizes effect on negative effect on periosteal blood supply. Availability, I think it's fair to say that locking plates are pretty available now, but there's no doubt that non-locking are far more widespread. Um, although I think in the third decade of the 21st century now, uh, locking plates are pretty available. Similarly, a lot of the companies are making their locking and non-locking implants of a similar price, usually by increasing the price of the uh, non-locking, I'm afraid. But um, you may still find that the non-locking constructs may be uh, a little cheaper. So in summary, any screw can be a lag screw uh, across an oblique or a spiral fracture. Countersinking is about strain reduction, not about making your fixation look pretty, and it's about stopping fracturing of the near cortex when you tighten the screw head. Neutralization is a powerful concept to mitigate outer plane forces on the construct. Only use dynamic compression really for transverse fractures or very short oblique ones. If you're going to do a short oblique one in compression, make sure the plate's in the anti glide position, which is also very useful with. Um, periarticular small fragments. Bridge plating is useful to span severely comminuted areas. And locking plates uh, have pros and cons, but are very good in the bridging mode and where there's poor bone. So I think one of the important things is to choose your construct carefully based on the personality of the fracture, based on what you're trying to achieve, based on the patient's physiology, and put some thought into it, and then you'll get the best results for your patient. That's it. Thank you very much.